All right, so I guess we'll uh, go ahead and get started. So thanks for uh, uh, choosing our, our session this afternoon. Uh, based on the conversation uh, from 15 minutes ago or so, we'll have to pretend that we're outside. So maybe uh, mentally this can be a, a virtually out on the lawn um, discussion. Um, so my name is Mark Carbone. I have a teaching background, but uh, currently serve as the Chief Information Officer for the Waterloo Region District School Board. So for me, it's really exciting to be in an IT leadership role, but have the teaching background and sort of bring those together, hopefully in a new and, and relatively inventive way. And it's my pleasure uh, this afternoon to present with uh, Andrew Bronski, one of our teachers. Uh, so I'm a secondary English teacher at Karen Heights in Kitchener. Um, I really enjoy, Mark and I have done this presentation a couple times, not this one specifically, but together, and I really enjoy it because we get a, it's a different dynamic of talking about as a CIO and at the top, the IT level, and how it, all the things that he does to support us and everything that's going on at the board, and then getting down to the classroom level and how, with that support, how does it look in my classroom, how does that play out for me as a classroom teacher. Uh, so I've been teaching the Futures Forum Project, which is an initiative down in the Marlowe region for the past five years now. Uh, it's cross-curricular, uh, it's really about integrating technology in the classroom, looking at your classroom differently, so I'll talk about that a little bit today. And uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Great. Okay. So I wanted to paint a little bit of a perspective for you today because really the whole idea of um, innovating in the classroom, and I would say purposeful disruption, uh, started to be a very open conversation in our school board five or six years ago. And it began at a point where uh, a number of us were, were sitting down on the senior team looking at you know, the age-old question. So what does the classroom of the future really look like? And we expanded that question to uh, include teachers. We included community partners. We asked um, vendors and industry in the Waterloo region to come and sit at the table with us. We had parents and trustees at the table. And at the end of the discussion, nobody could really pin it down. So we thought, okay, what other tact can we take to take to this? And so we went back to the, the community partners and said, all right, so what does a job description look like for you? What are you looking for in your future employees? What skill sets do they need? And that started to get into uh, a, better, a better idea of the skills that, that students need. And as you could predict now, sort of thinking what that conversation might have been <coughs> five years ago, all the things around uh, using communication and collaboration tools, flexible schedules, and all those kinds of things around problem solving, bringing out ideas, the importance of communicating. All of those things started to emerge, which was important for us because it led to, so what do we do in our classrooms to foster those things to happen? So out of that discussion, uh, which was several meetings, several months long, as it typically is in, in uh, an educational setting, uh, a few of us enrolled in a, a course at that time through Powerful Learning Practice. And we, um, as a team, sort of immersed ourselves into the student world. And so we got into social media and we were blogging and we were connecting with people on Twitter and other, other forums uh, with an eye to, again, what does this mean for a teacher? At the end of that year-long experience, uh, we had to design an action research project. And the action research project turned out to be the Futures Forum project. So we didn't do it actually as part of the course. It was sort of a post event. Uh, but it was very interesting for us because uh, we tried to look at what can we do that's purposefully disruptive. And, and that's, that's really the part for me that was almost the best part, was just thinking it all through. So we designed a program uh, after a lot of discussion that would avoid what I think of as a traditional pitfall, let's do it with this one teacher in this one classroom and we'll all watch and see what happens. It's too small. There's nothing organic about that that really changes practice. And so we made a pitch for doing something that will be across multiple schools um, and very different. And so what it turned out to be was based on four core attributes. So. Put yourself in the mindset of a traditional secondary school now. So four semester periods, common lunch as, as the scenario. So we decided to move forward with a package that had uh, one teacher, but they were working with students in a different way. They would teach actually across two time slots. So a half day block of time, if you would. They would have the same students for 
in our case periods one and two. But we also made a conscious decision as we looked at sort of cross schools that all schools would agree to do it during periods one and two. And so it made it easier to connect some other activities. It was based on the idea of one teacher delivering actually three different uh, courses. So we had uh, grade 10 English, the half credit civics and half credit careers program. So one teacher would cover the whole combination pack of that. And it addressed what we thought was the four N's of learning. Anytime, anywhere, anything, anyone learning. And when we set out to design our program then, these are the foundational pieces um, that, that we, we worked on. It was really exciting working with the group of teachers to just say, given those four core elements, what might this look like? And uh, so some of this um, may seem old in today's world, but it was important work for us, and it paints the context for what Andrew's going to share with you in his part of the presentation. Writing online at that time, we really wanted to experiment with getting off of paper and into online, sort of that idea of from paper to publishing. What did that mean for students? And then if you sort of push on that around inquiry-based learning, project-based learning, make that a focus point of the instructional practice for that project, that was very important. So we looked at uh, content creation in the original version of this. Um, the students were responsible to do collaborative inquiry and groups of students had to publish online once a month and there was a commitment to do that. I think one of the most unique features and a very powerful feature in this was establishing our cross-school novel study. And so in the initial version of this program we had seven teachers but they were one teacher in seven different schools and they all chose a different novel. But I, as a student, I didn't have to sign up with a teacher in my classroom. I could sign up with a teacher in any of the other schools. And so it started to give the student voice, student choice piece. And we had um, access to the Adobe Connect um, server, which is, of course, licensed through OSAPAC as a way of video communication between the students, teachers, and a way of interacting as part of that novel study. We also asked, um, as part of the program, that there was a commitment to leveraging social media. And so even back then, five years ago, we had students with Twitter accounts. We had established common hashtags for the course name. I think we had FFP, WRDSV, or the other way around, we've forgotten now. Both happened. Both happened. And so there was a common thread. And one of the best things that came out of that was uh, the teachers landing on this idea of leveraging TED Talks. And over time, that sort of grew organically into something that's affectionately known now as TED Talk Fridays. And so the teachers would collaborate and agree on which TED Talk they would show, and students would share their learning, ask their questions, share their insights, all through this Twitter hashtag. And so there was this giant stream of uh, public information around using the TED Talks and tying that into the curriculum. So, that was actually very successful. And when we look at what are the things that made a difference, we can look at the context of the learning. Uh, one context would be uh, from the, the student perspective. Uh, I think one of the things that we learned out of this was teachers, parents, and students just through informal surveys were all talking about a change in engagement factors. But students like this. There were early trends uh, which have continued now through this day of students spending more time on their course materials, uh, more engaged uh, in, in, the, in the activities of, of learning. And probably more powerfully, a lot of students that indicated that they were hesitant to ask a question in class or jump into an in-class conversation, they were very happy to jump into a social media environment and participate. And so we started to see this shift. One of the things that we asked teachers to experiment with was having a teacher Facebook page. So not friends with students, um, but a, a page where you could post links to websites, links to resources, you could post questions, example tests, you know, wikis, all kinds of things would be there. And it was interesting as the teachers were doing that, in my role as the IT leader, I was actually following those pages. And 
it was very interesting to see when was the activity on those pages. And so we started to notice that most of the activity was actually outside of school time, even though the kids had access to Facebook and Twitter and so on in school. And you could see then these patterns started to evolve of students helping students. And a student that didn't ask a question in class was now asking it on the Facebook page and other students were starting to respond. And so it started to build a very informal, loosely knit um, learning community online that was associated with the teacher. So that was very powerful. We had very similar feedback from, from the students about the Twitter experience, that they felt like they had a voice and that they could say things or ask things that they might not have been comfortable with um, in that sense of um, participating right in the class. So that was really interesting. Change hats now. What made a difference for teachers? Well, a different, a different perspectives came out of this, but I think just as we did as the initial group that participated in the Powerful Learning Practice program, teachers were learning these same tools as the students. I mean, that's one of the interesting things to me. At a moment in time, it doesn't matter whether you're 80, 50, or 5, the same suite of tools is available. And there's a question. Do you leverage them? Do you get the best out of the tools? Or do you put them off to the side? And when you start to experiment with them, we started to see a lot of positives. Positives way outweighed the negatives. I remember receiving some comments from school boards um, just asking about our experience of unblocking Facebook because we were one of the first boards to do that. And we actually found, and it was interesting talking to vice principals, a number of the incidents of bullying actually went down because things became more transparent. There was nothing hidden. They could say, look what Johnny said about me online. And there it is. It's not hidden. It's not out there. It's right here. And as our students became more acclimatized to using uh, Facebook and Twitter and other tools in innovative ways, it's actually settled in. Now it's part of the culture. And so uh, it was interesting for me to see my daughter, uh, who was in high school at the time we started to do this, coming home and saying, oh, it was really neat, Dad. We had this Facebook group <coughs> where the kids were collaborating and they were doing all these things during their class time. It's just a whole new way of collaborating. It doesn't have to be necessarily a formal uh, LMS. Um, on the, so actually can I go back one slide for a second. I think the other thing on the, the teacher front, and we didn't realize this initially, but it kind of came out through the feedback over time, was that one of the things that we realized in hindsight that made this very successful actually turned out to be the fact that we chose one teacher in seven different schools. Because the teachers were in a little bit more of an isolated mode, um, what actually happened was that they were forced to collaborate in a different way. They couldn't just talk at a department meeting or they couldn't talk to the teacher across the hall. They actually had to use these same tools to collaborate and figure out how to operate. So it shifted their practice, it shifted the way they thought about these tools. They started looking at these tools as enablers. And so that became very powerful for us. One of the things that I think was very valuable out of this is we did a lot of data collecting. So we collected, um, at this point in time, data over four years. Each year we've collected uh, data from student feedback, parent feedback, teacher feedback. We did focus studies, um, all, all kinds of uh, things. And we worked with a third party independent company so that we weren't influencing the data uh, to put together a picture. And this is, uh, I think, something that you'll, you'll find quite interesting. We found in those different cohorts uh, over the four years, and these are not students tapped on the shoulder, they were just randomly selected through the timetabling process, uh, that we were finding difference in their achievement scores uh, in the two to five percent range. And so right across um, looking at the means, we saw big shifts in student achievement by virtue of taking this approach to things. And so that was very interesting for us. And now we're at a stage where we say, okay, this has been repeated over the different schools, teachers, and student cohorts. What are the nuggets out of this that we can use as building blocks uh, to go forward? 
And I think that's an important reflective question that we have to ask as individual teachers involved in the process, but also uh, as an organization. So what's in it for us? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the journey here. Uh, Timetabling was a challenge. I mentioned earlier that uh, we had agreed that all schools would sort of agree on periods one and two, and I think initially we rolled this out in semester two. And so that was a way to easily collaborate. But then as this sort of caught interest and people were watching, it's like, well, with that same equipment, we could run this in both semesters, so there was no cost, and we expanded that way. And then, of course, it went to the, you could do morning and afternoon in both semesters, and so we got that far in terms of expanding the program, so essentially at one point it was running in all of our secondary schools. Eventually, as um, the program was growing, timetabling constraints, all these things start to come into play, and I would say at this point in time, we're at a little bit of a juggernaut. Principals are having to make very difficult decisions. What if I don't have enough staff that are willing to teach this three-course combo pack? That becomes a, um, a limiting factor in some senses. What if um, I have to make a decision around, do I run another Futures Forum section, or am I going to cut drama, I'm going to protect drama, and go down a Futures Forum? And we started to run into these logistical uh, challenges. So that was, that was one element uh, that that's where things are now. And I think probably if you actually measured strict numbers, we probably have a few fewer sections of that running at this point just because of those kinds of challenges, shifting in student enrollment and other factors. Uh, there is, um, I love this, this phrase that uh, Andrew and I landed on, the binder problem. Uh, that's something that's a reality for us. The original teachers that were in this from the very beginning they developed the course. They learned the tools. They were the ones that were isolated. They made this theirs. They owned it. And as other teachers started to watch become interest in moving forward in this, then they would say, well, I want to teach Futures Forum, but where's the binder? Just hand over your things and I'll carry on. And we realized as we were working through this process that that's when the aha moment about the isolation went on. Just because Andrew was the Futures Forum teacher in his school and he hands over the binder to me, that doesn't mean that it's put in the same context with the same experience, with the same shift in practice. And that's what was really interesting about this. And so in response to the binder problem, what we've ended up doing is actually splitting the teachers into different cohorts. So there's a few sort of slightly different versions of Futures Forum. Again, each cohort can own their own version of it. it. wasn't intended to be cookie cutter. It was the idea of being disruptive in new ways that would have a bit of a ripple effect across the system. So in terms of mixing it up now and, and nurturing spin-offs, that's been one of the good things, is this has started a lot of conversations. And so some teachers are doing a mini version of Futures Forum just within one class, or maybe they've started more cautiously with another class in the school, something like that. It's not necessarily the cross-school piece. But I have to say, personally, I believe that inter-school, whether it's within your own school board or somewhere else in the world, that's a part that makes a huge difference because it really makes you rethink and collaborate in, in brand new ways. And then lastly, uh, scaling up. Um, this is kind of brings us up to today. Um, so we have, um, over the last, uh, well, I guess three or four years, been gradually building up our <coughs> Wi-Fi network, putting uh, uh, mobile devices into classrooms. We've had a variety of strategies there, um, not to get too off into the technology part, because this really wants to focus on student learning. Um, but our board does support both iPads and Chromebooks. We still have some labs. We're in a giant shift of things that's going on right now. But I would say, by and large, schools are gravitating to uh, Chromebooks and iPads in droves, much less on sort of the Windows netbook idea. Even though that was one of our choices, we just find people pulling back from that environment. And we're starting through a process now of how do we sort of tease schools through the process of 
taking out the labs. So we've started that in elementary schools, first with dismantling the labs, and now we have this program that we've kind of dubbed the Sliders Model. So as we go around to each school and look at what equipment is up for replacement, uh, what we're saying is, let's say for example, the school has 15 desktops up for replacement, we're saying you can't put 15 desktops back in. You have to mix it up, some mobile and some desktops. If you want to go all mobile, that's fine. And you can pick the mix of Chromebooks and iPads. <coughs> so we give them some choice in this. The idea is that each device has strengths and weaknesses. And wouldn't it be great if both devices could be supported in terms of the IT back end, the management, but also supported through workshops and best practice that in an ideal setting, teachers would have access to the technology and they could choose the tool that best fits the learning environment. That was really our, our hope out of that. And so that's something that we're working through uh, in our elementary schools right now. Uh, on the high school side, um, they've really benefited from this point, extra equipment, primarily Chromebooks at this point, and we're, we're just starting the conversation of starting to pull some labs out. So just as I get ready to hand things off to Andrew here, where we're at with one-to-one uh, -one is this year we have uh, three of our secondary schools uh, where we did one-to-ones with all grade nines. And so that's just rolled out this fall. Feedback so far has been very, very positive. Those three schools already want to take the nines to 10 and do Chromebooks with next year's grade nine. It's been a very powerful uh, transition and uh, Andrew's been right in the thick of both the uh, Features Forum project as well as the um, helping to lead his school uh, in terms of the one-to-one -one initiative. And so maybe this is a good point to sort of slide into uh, your part of the presentation. Uh, sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, can I ask a question, Mark? Oh, certainly. Uh, what you were just describing to the one-to-one, -one, is that your, the board's been paying for the devices for all the nines in those three schools? We did. Yeah, it's been awesome. Great. Okay. And it's it's the device belongs to the student, so they can take it home and the whole bit. It's not kept at the school. It's your Chromebook. So the way the board paying and the students keeping it? Uh, we haven't figured out what happens after four years yet. If if this unfolds the way I hope it would unfold, the idea is in essence this would be the start of phasing in one to one Chromebooks for all secondary schools. Right. So the question, I guess, on the table is, what value is a Chromebook at the end of four years? And you collect them back in and sell them, you collect them and recycle them, or the kids can buy them for a, I don't know, it's. I, I get the idea, not it. You guys own it, but it's, it's attached to the student for the time being, like with their career. It is, so we had to, we actually worked with Andrew and a few other teachers to come up with a model for deployment and basically we decided all other IT equipment is kind of organized and tracked centrally. And so what we did was do a bulk purchase of Chromebooks. Uh, we made sure uh, on the back end that all the Chromebooks uh, fired up, that there was no, no duds in the mix, so to speak. Uh, we brought them up to the latest version of Chrome, which is actually, uh, if you ever get into this kind of a project, very critical, because some older versions of Chrome 38 is a really dangerous one. It's bad on the Wi-Fi and the end speeds. So we brought them right up to the current Chrome levels. We also buy our Chromebooks with the license so that we can, we looked after pre-enrolling them into our Google Apps environment. We actually printed labels um, so that each student got a box with their name and their homeroom and uh, that's the way they were shipped to the schools. And so the school then, um, organized a pickup system, different strategies there. Some just had the kids come down on the first day or two of school and they did it alphabetically. Other schools reorganized them by homerooms and we did that kind of approach. Let, let the schools choose that. So, thank you. Does that help? Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Pretty uh, one more question on that. Sure. What about the in service for your teachers uh, as far as your grade nine teachers now and, and, and that will be? Glad you asked that question. If I'm getting into your I, it's going to hold up, but feel free to go in. We're doing just I'm fine. Just I know it's a lead in, so yeah. No, yeah, it's, no, it's a great segue. Thank you. Just give, you give me your ten dollars later. <laughs> <laughs> give me the hook when it's yeah. time. Um, 
I think the one thing that we, we wrestled with a little bit, um, and I'll say wrestled in a friendly sense, was what things did we want consistent at the system level and across the schools, anticipating that this may grow and, and go larger? Uh, and what things should be handled at the site level? And so the idea of this, again, is to disrupt with technology. And I think after an initial meeting uh, in June that had some IT folks there, the school uh, principals, and, and two or three teachers selected by each principal, um, we started to talk about what did that look like. And I think probably within the one meeting, we walked away with the idea that this would actually work best if, uh, for the most part, the uh, uh, preparation was done at the school level. Um, and so the schools could come up with a model that could or could not have central support, depending on what they chose, uh, to move it forward. Uh, generally speaking, I think in all the PD things I've been involved with in my career, but certainly within our board, I would say if you do a two top down, it's rigid and all, there's less uptake. And we wanted change, uh, we wanted buy-in. And so we took a two-step approach. We run a, a computer camp uh, in the summer uh, for our staff, and it's, it's based on an open learning model that's self-directed learning, it's just facilitated learning. And so we invited a team from each school to participate in that event where their project that they brought to camp was to actually provide the leadership for the PD that would happen at their school. And so then there was a PD session that was run in <coughs> late August this year in preparation for the rollout, and I'll maybe leave that part for you to talk about in your part of your comment. Do you want to play at Conversation or is that Conversation here? Or? Sure. You can jump to that. Sure. I'll let you take this one. Uh, so I guess just a quick intro into this. Um, Mark, just so uh, as a second year teacher myself and helping with this one in one implementation, I'm going to go through like my story, my experience a little bit here in a bit. But uh, Mark came in and just kind of started documenting. So a few short videos we're going to play here from some staff at our school just talking about what their experience is going for Google Apps Education, uh, teachers at different levels and different points in their experience. We'll kind of answer some of your questions here a little bit too and how it's played out. But uh, as a whole, and it's been kind of a shift, and really to answer your question, not a whole lot. But it, then, then that's been a very positive experience and it's an interesting way of looking at normally think we want to do something new in the classroom. We need to bring everyone to the board and sit down here, like long conversations, like very top down approach. And this was more of a let's get Chromebooks in kids' hands, tell staff that you're going to have one to one in your classroom, now your kids are going to have laptops every day and they can take them home. And then let's see how that changes your practice. And it's been actually a really positive experience. And I would say, just from my standpoint as a teacher, from and again, don't get me wrong, I, I do enjoy PD. I learn a lot from PD, like formal sessions that are run by admin in schools and top to top down approach. But I would say I've seen more change in teacher practice and more evolution in what's happening in our classrooms in the past month by just giving kids Chromebooks and saying they've got them than I've seen from a day at anywhere, at any session or coming here for a day. And I, I love GAF summits and change my practice as a teacher, but just by saying, here's the device, your, your class is one on one, it's been transformative for our school. Absolutely. All right, and so uh, this is the conversation Mark had with Ed Doe. He's the principal of my high school. Just kind of talking about what this process has been like. Uh, the accommodation steering committee meeting yesterday. I thought uh, at the meeting Ed shared a wonderful uh, perspective, and uh, that would actually be a good spot to kick off our conversation today. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, sometime during the summer, uh, I read an article on uh, I think it was the CNN website, but. And it talked about uh, ranking presidents of the United States using the criteria which president of the United States changed the discussion in the country the most. And, and I thought that uh, changing the conversation was a kind of a nice paradigm to talking about educational change because we've had things come and we've had things go. And um, the president that changed the conversation the most, by the way, was Ronald Reagan, according yeah. to that survey. And, and I, I pondered that a little bit and thought, okay, in terms of what we're doing with the Chromebook project, and we certainly saw it in the interviews today, mm -hmm. um, this is fundamentally changing the conversation in the school. This, like no other initiative I've ever seen, has uh, changed the way people not only interact in their classroom, but interact with their colleagues, interact with the school board office, interact with the administration, and it is a fundamental see change in how we do business in schools today. And that's only been 
but it's not less than two months in, and that, that's we're already seeing that, and that came out in the interview. Well, and I, I know some of the, the uh, folks today uh, that we chatted with openly said, I'm pretty new at this, mm -hmm. um, but described really transformative um, changes in how they were looking at things, so very powerful. So in terms of seeing maybe what happens next with this project, do you have any final comments? Um, in terms of what, from the system level? or mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this to me is one of those experiments that has been so successful right from the beginning that it would be my hope that this would map out not only for the next four years for the, and, and afterwards for kids that come to my school, but that other schools take a look at what's going on and are caught up in the same, the same wave. And that it's not too far into the future before every grade nine kid walking into a, a school uh, in the Waterloo Region District School Board gets their Chromebook on the first day of school and, and it just becomes a natural part of what happens in education in this part of Ontario. Um, so Mark's already done a great job of talking with the Finnish <coughs> Forum project. So I've been teaching in it for five years. Um, it's been phenomenal as a teacher. It's been really transformative practice. Uh, one, the idea of going cross group or having the same group of students for two periods back to back um, really allowed me to do a lot of different things in my classroom as a teacher. Um, we're, has anyone heard of MSIP? Like I'm stepping up from support. So there's three high schools in our region, not the one-on-one -one project schools, but uh, my school overlaps with both. We've got what's called uh, MSIP, it's multi-subject instructional period. Um, what it is, instead of having say four, say five minute periods, we have five, 60 minute periods. So we took 15 minutes off each of the four blocks, and then these students have a period that's uh, cross grades, so it's a mix of class, classroom teacher in there, but there's no formal instruction happening. And they get one period every day for an hour where it's essentially kind of, kind of like a work period for them where they have resources. So they can travel amongst the school, work with other people. We have grade 11 or grade 10 students mentoring grade nine students. Um, if you want help with a certain subject, you can travel to another classroom. If like I said, I'm an English teacher and you've got a math question, I actually was a strong math student, you should be able to help you out. But if I can't get it, you can travel to another classroom and see a math teacher. So for my school, I actually had my kids for uh, three periods at points, and uh, having them for that three hours together um, really allowed to change what I was doing in my classroom. Um, for a lot of us, there's a very big focus on content or trying to get through the curriculum, and while I'm definitely working through all of that, um, I could overlap. So if I'm looking at civics and English that day, we might be looking at a concept or a learning standpoint from the civics, but they're going to try and demonstrate the learning through English, and I could overlap that way. It really opened up a lot of ability to kind of improve my class time. Um, it started off, we had uh, Windows Netbooks in the early going. Uh, we've slowly transitioned to Chromebook, and it was about a one to three ratio in the beginning, it became one to two in the second or third year. And the past couple years, kind of piloting into this, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have a one to one class with Chromebooks. And it was a really big change in my practice. Even having that one to three ratio, or one to two to one to one, made a really big difference in how I could do things in my class. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, by the way, for myself, if you guys ever have questions, please feel free to jump in. I'm very free flowing. If you stop me, if you want to know something. Just a question. Yeah. Curiosity. Yeah. Uh, in my school, um, they're starting to include the Chromebook and Windows Chromebook. Yes. Is it just lately that we understood the difference between the laptop and the Chromebook sure. and so forth? The iPad is still uh, a problem because people are not seeing how they're going to use it. How is it in your board or in your schools? How you know, about the, iPad. the way it's played on our board, and this is not true because we have a definitely crossover between both, I would say on average the iPad's been taken on more in the primary levels in K-8, to and at second year we're using a lot more Chromebooks, and I kind of see where <coughs> that being said, there are a lot of Chromebooks at, in K-8, to and we definitely have iPads, I've got a few iPads in my secondary classroom. It depends what you're looking at too. Um, I personally see the iPad as very much as a personal device. Uh, it, it's not, doesn't, it's not a really great sharing device in most class or having a bookable cart uh, where the Chromebook is because you just log in and all your stuff comes with it. Do you, I'm oh, sorry. So I was going to just jump in maybe yeah. with one additional point. Um, when we deployed our iPads, our, our initial strategy was uh, to give uh, some units to every school simultaneously. And the, the thought behind that was start the conversations uh, and not do big roll-ups in some schools and phase it over the years that way. We wanted to ignite the conversation. We felt that was very important. Um, 
in an effort to help people recognize that uh, Chromebooks and iPads and so on are different tools. They're not just desktops that you can carry around. We, we decided on two strategies to help people think about them differently. Uh, so the first thing we did was we avoided deploying them in groups of 30. And we actually put them out in groups of 20 so that people had to start thinking right out of the box about how do I use these to support individual and small group instruction. We also did not enable printing on Wi-Fi. Uh, didn't win a lot of friends per se uh, on that, but it did help people think about them as a different kind of tool. Um, so, and we're still that way. We don't have printing turned on on our Wi-Fi at this point. That will come. I expect as we blow through this shift, but um, we really want people to learn the tools and see the new possibilities and do the things that we think are important around shifting your practice rather than just using them as desktops. Um, so as we started to bring more and more technology in your class and whatever it may be, uh, one thing we kind of kept talking back to is like, what is it doing? So if we have tech in our classroom now, whatever it may be, and it's been a Chrome for myself for the most part, and going one on one, what does that look like? And what am I doing in my classroom? How does that change learning for my students? How does that change what I can do in my classroom? Some of them playing around with them. I'm just curious who's familiar with the SAMR model? This before? Yeah, number here. Um, and so this was kind of a good focus for us. I really enjoyed this model as a teacher because I kind of, like, I was definitely, in, and it's look, it's kind of a tiered bit. You kind of start off this idea of substitution, tech acts as a direct substitute with no functional change. Um, and that's when we're talking about the one-to-one -one and like talk, you asked about how is that training for teachers going. This is what we're a lot of seeing. This is where most people start is uh, a lot of our teachers are saying, hey, your kid's got Chromebooks now and you've got this one-to-one -one model. They're just taking what they already were giving to them and saying, hey, here's a paper worksheet. Instead of doing a paper, now you're just doing it on the Chromebook. You didn't really change your practice in any way. The students are essentially doing the same thing. Don't get me wrong, there's some positives to that still. They now have easier access to it. There's easier sharing back and forth between you if you're using Google Docs. There's some positive that come with that, but you haven't really changed what you're doing in your classroom. You're not really affecting learning in any way. Um, and they kind of giant some diet augmentations, so text as a direct substitute with functional improvement. I'm going to go through an example for myself how my practice started, how it's kind of shifted over time. But what you really want to start trying to do is transform the area here. We have these devices for your students, and the Chromebook is a fantastic tool. You can start really doing brand new things that really weren't a possibility even five, six, seven, eight years ago in your classroom. Uh, so an example for me, uh, even before we went to GAP as a board, uh, as a high school English teacher, I really loved Google Docs. So that was a fantastic way for people to collaborate, look at writing, and evolve that over time. So I had my, I was asking my students, kind of, hey, can you go create a Google account and share these back and forth with me? It was a really, uh, any Google Classroom users in here? Uh, I love Classroom, it saves me. This, this used to be like a 60 step process for me. Like I would create a Google Doc, a template, I would post it to my class website, my students would go there, open the document, click on file, make a copy, they click on share, they type in my email address, they would get it wrong so I wouldn't get it, so I have to follow people again and try and find it. I would go into my share it folder, find it, boot it a folder, organize all the stuff together, try and give them some feedback, and then go and remind them that I'd give them some feedback. And there's this bizarre process of going through all that. And I loved it, it was amazing. This was about five years ago and it was fantastic. And now Classroom's like click, 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 you're done, it's all set up for you. Uh, but looking at this process here, so I'm just going to give you actually some examples. This is years ago now. Uh, it's the first time I actually tried using Google Docs, and my practice evolved a lot with my students and how I use it. Uh, but as this example pops here, so here's a kind of finished off document um, from one of my students. And this is a grade 10 class, my first uh, second year of features form. And I can see your finished product here. Um, on a very basic level, just in the idea of feedback. Again, we've always given our students feedback, but uh, I remember as an English teacher, I had, like, you know, as a student as well, you know, scribbles all over the place, I can fold this arrow here, and by the time I get to my second or uh, so my 20th or 25th essay, my writing's getting really terrible. This is a nice, really easy streamlined process for our students where you can see things are highlighted. This is something that you give me feedback on. If you click on it, the dialog box pops out, and this is what my teacher wants me to get. And it was an asynchronous conversation for me. Again, a lot of our classes, they're large. We've got 25 to 30 kids in our class. I've always thought the best way to work with someone is on a one-to-one -one space, but we don't have time for that in our classes and work. But going this route, I can essentially have an asynchronous conversation with my students. So they're doing the work here. And when I can jump on prep or I get some time at home, I can jump in, leave them some comments, and they can reply back to me. We can have that conversation back and forth. Um, what I really like, again, just kind of to the class, you can have multiple editors too. So when it comes to peer editing, you can share with the student, get feedback that way, they're learning from each other. Um, one of the things I really love though is this idea of C revision history. 
and we get a look into your students' head now and their kind of insight. I can look at their evolution of learning. Are they actually using the feedback I'm giving them? Prior to going to this model, I would say as an English teacher, I give maybe four major paragraph assignments once a month. And I would give them one in September, they would go and do it, I would assess it, put it on a rubric, I'd give them some feedback, and we'd move on. And I'd wait a month and I'd come back to see where the learning is at. When they walked out, that paragraph probably ended up in the recycling bin, they lost the feedback, they probably didn't really do a whole lot of time with the feedback, they look at the mark, and then they kind of walked away, which I get that, that's what a lot of our students do. Um, I've made the shift kind of moving away from that and kind of going more of a form process back and forth with my students. So I can look at the evolution of their learning. Are they actually using it? So I can scroll down here and look at an early copy of this. And I like using this one because the students uh, who came from another school board to us, another school, uh, from brand new school, were very so scope and sequence at my school. So like these are the skills we want you to learn in grade nine, and then we have these basic expectations for you to start at grade 10. So I jump back in time, look at an early version of her writing, I stand the class, I do my lesson, this is my expectations for your paragraph, and this is what I got. And when I came in here as a teacher, I'm like, okay, I clearly did not do a great job reaching you. I had a lot of things you want to take away from this, and this is what we walked away with. Um, but through this revision process now, I'm like myself going and giving feedback, and other, other students jumping on her doc and giving her some feedback, I can quickly click through and see, all right, is she actually using the feedback she was given? So like, as, I, as I evolve through stock, okay, someone's mentioned that she needs to double space. Um, look up here, you can see To Kill a Mockingbird is not in italics, identified as a book. I can see these things evolve over time. She starts to add an MOA. And so this is a really quick, easy insight into this, uh, I have my student's mind and I see an issue really using the feedback that I'm giving her. Another big focus is I can mark my speech form is this idea of collaboration. It's kind of evolved for us over time too. Once you've got strong Wi-Fi in your school and devices for your kids, you can really break down your classroom walls and open them up to the world. Um, I focus a lot as a teacher on engagement and I find authenticity for your, whatever you're doing in your class. If it's got something more than just a mark in the day for them, it completely changes the engagement of my kids. I have no classroom problems, classroom management's like not an issue for me anymore and the work I get for my students is infinitely better. And so one example of this, I actually said my grade 10 kids, they were mentoring a grade four class through uh, their summer project in the year in social studies. So uh, working with another teacher um, about 20 minutes from us in Waterloo, uh, Alison Bullock here was a grade four teacher. Um, she set up a project where she wanted her kids to look at one major project and they were holding a museum in their school. And so what we set up was my grade tens for their civic summative was they were going to actually mentor her grade fours through their process. There's small groups on both ends. And so they, they pick something that they both so focus on social studies. So for example, uh, the pyramids. Okay, and they're at this museum. So her, uh, she had about a group of three kids who were going to focus on the pyramids, do research into that. I went to my group of grade tens and said, okay guys, here's the basic structure. And we actually looked at the curriculum docs from grade four and said, your job is to set this up and mentor them through this entire process. This is how you're gonna demonstrate being an active citizen. And it was actually a great time to apply class. It was pretty funny. The first day I started this uh, through the Futures Forum project, we got some release time to go see other teachers' classrooms to see what's going on. So I had another teacher who was just the first time at FFP and she teaching an apply class as well, come to my class that day. And so I went through this project, told the grade tens what they were doing, here's your group, go I'll jump online, jump on your Chromebooks, start doing some research and get this ready. And then we kind of went off to the side, we're talking for 15, 20 minutes and gotten off to some really good conversational classroom practice and stuff. And then I can still remember, he stopped me like mid-sentence. He said, he was just looking at my class, like, are they always this engaged? And I turn around and everyone was completely zoned into this project. And in my, if you've taught grade 10 apply before, that you can rarely say that, uh, but that was my experience that day because it had this authentic piece where they were tied to their classroom and had real life value. And I said, like, you know, if you guys tank on this, you're gonna be not just hurting yourself, you're gonna be hurting this group of grade fours. And uh, this, the work I got from them was really phenomenal. It was a very simple thing. So they collaborated in a bunch of different ways. They had, my guys were building websites with Weebly for them to go through on their Chromebooks. Uh, and that was how they structured these students, the grade four. So they were jumping on the website, seeing what my grade tens had put together. Um, and that led into a shared Google Doc where the grade four started brainstorming and my guys were sharing back with them and giving them some feedback on that. And then that led into uh, Google Hangouts. We set up a hangout in a class where my grade ten, three, three grade tens would walk up and talk to the three grade fours they'd be partnered with and collaborating digitally online. And both my, uh, myself and Allison found this kind of really, we saw much better work than we ever seen our smarter students in these projects before. Um, I'm just looking at time here, I'm gonna skip past. I had a quick video of one of the hangouts between the kids, but I'll skip past that now. 
Um, another big focus for us with going into now, now you've got one on one, you've got Wi Fi in the schools, being a kind of shift to project based learning, which I was just kind of talking about there, and also this idea of inquiry based learning. Um, Mark mentioned the Futures Forum. We had what was called the Online Book Club, where we had students working with different teachers from different schools in a collaborative book project. Um, how that's evolved in my school, like I, I'm always, as a teacher, I'm always really interested in teacher practice and what are best practices and collaborating with one another. And so this semester has kind of trickled down within my own school. And so my grade 11 uh, university English class, um, we've got four sections right now. And we do a kind of essentially a novel study where the students have a choice of one of eight novels to do. And they can choose whatever they like. Um, but then we get some, we get small groups. We focus on small groups, such so like three or four kids in a class. And so while it's fantastic, and this kids got student voice, they don't have a whole lot of people to communicate with about the book. So we decided to do at the same time or four sections throughout the day. We had an open cloud with blog. Let me just jump into this really quickly here. And so we just put this quick uh, website together for our students. They come here. Um, we went for our first one last week. And so here's the nine book choices they had. And the students could choose this. And instead of being just tied to the three or four kids in their class, uh, now they can have a group of about 20 to 25 people. Okay, or some, so we have some smaller choices in the books, so it might be a group of 10. Um, and now when they're reflecting on their text at certain points, they jump on this blog, they're sharing their reflections, their analysis of the text, and now they can read the reflections of other students in their school, but in different periods, and see their reflections on the wall. And they're responding back and forth. Uh, they have a really broad, open kind of topic for their essays that they're going to be doing on these novels at the end, and they're working through that process. They're giving feedback back and forth. They're sharing quotations. They're sharing insight into the book. Um, there's a respectful disagreement happening. So if I just jump on, I'll jump to four one nine here. Um, so I can see after one, I think there's about eight or nine kids doing this book. And I see there's been twenty eight comments here. So I can jump in. I can see what they're going through. And again, I'm not just looking at my own students in my classroom here, but I can see responses from different students kind of what they're getting from this and what they're taking on the text and the evolution of their thought process and their learning. And again, it's, I really found this kind of comes back to authenticity again in that reading through some of these posts, they are, some of them are really, really strong and they're much better here than what I had in a quick writing assignment I had in my class earlier. And again, I think it really comes back to that authentic piece. If you're only handing something to your teacher, it's like, okay, it's a quick thing, I'll pout it off. But if it's going live online, and I know if peers across me throughout grade 11, are we coming on this and looking at this, or someone can just kind of find my posting here, we talk about digital citizenship and your online presence a lot, I'm saying, like, you know, it's really important that they don't just find that what you were doing on the weekend, or maybe you shouldn't have been doing it, you post to Facebook, but when a university who's looking at acceptance or an employer researches you, can they find something very positive about you? And so they're building that digital presence here through doing good critical analysis of what they're doing in school. Uh, so I want to kind of slide into the house. That's kind of like my story and how I evolved to here as a teacher in my practice. But now that we're looking at this idea of one to one, and uh, we just started for about six weeks in now. Uh, literally, it happened very quick. And it was great. Like you, know, you sound like okay, you're giving advice to every kid in your school uh, in grade nine. It was about 300 Chromebooks away in our school this year. Um, clearly, like a lot of time and thought went into that. It's been like lots of work together and like lots of collaboration. And while we definitely had some of that, and there was a lot of thought process to it, at the end of the day, it really kind of mean. Here's a device to the kid on the first day of school, the second day of school, and go. And we, like, we came together as a staff on a PDA, PDA for like half a day back in June. And then in the first PDA in August this year, we had some talk about this again. But it was very quick and it was very self-guided. Um, and again, I saw this picture, it was perfect for this, because I think one plus one here, I think it was two, but it's been, again, I cannot say enough good things about how great it's been and what I've seen from teacher practice in our school. Uh, we talk about we talk about things we've been talking about for five or six years, all of a sudden just magically happening. The learning that's happening in your school, what teachers are doing with their classrooms, just because those kids have the advice now. I think we like a lot of times there's a negative perception of teachers about not wanting to make changes or not evolving with the times. And I think it's just for most of them, it hasn't worked in one way or another. They don't have the resources to do it. And again, having someone like Mark at the top to kind of facilitate this for this, it's been phenomenal the change I've seen in our school amongst our staff. Okay. Um, and so we just want to kind of share again some hearing us talk the whole time. Uh, Mark came in, just some different teachers at different points in their careers, different parts of experiences. Just want to have some different voices talking about what it's been like after six weeks to have this kind of one-to-one -one ratio in school, having the Chromebooks there, and how that's changed practice and how it's looked for students. So, uh, as an older teacher, um, and teaching this class, I worked for 20 years, uh, this whole Chromebook and working on a computer and the Google Cloud was very foreign to me and I felt very um, intimidated by it initially. 
But um, I thought, I'm going to get on board. And, uh, I'm going to learn this. I want to stay relevant. I want to stay current with what's going on. And so I decided to sort of come into this slowly. And the first thing I tried was uh, the whole Google Apps, where students would submit their work to me online in the cloud. And I would then give them um, formative feedback and um, on their actual writing. So I started that about two years ago. And uh, it completely changed my thinking on um, how this all can work. And I absolutely loved it. I remember um, uh, emailing my, it was on a Saturday morning, I was dutifully marking grade 11 essays. And um, I remember, uh, English essays, I remember uh, emailing my department head and just being blown away at how easy this was and how quickly I was catching on and how quickly I was able to give feedback and you know highlight something, comment on it, underline things, highlight things in red, whatever I wanted to do. And um, and my I can type very quickly and so my typing so I was able to give very in-depth formative feedback immediately, send it to the kid. And then the, the, the thing the amazing thing was the student a few students that morning happened to be also be online and they sent me things back immediately <coughs> with their changes and and so I was, I was hooked immediately, and I haven't, um, I've been on board ever since. And then so much so that I decided I wanted to do the e-learning um, project, and I've done that. This is my second semester doing that. I absolutely love it. Have again been completely changed my uh, teaching practice in that regard. Um, I've tried to build a community of writers online with my uh, writing class, the you know, Writers Crush, and that again has been revolutionary in the sense that um, students have really uh, appreciated this community of writers that we're trying to build. Lots of discussion, lots of back and forth, lots of um, feedback as quickly as I'm able to give it. And now the Chromebooks in grade nine here at Huron has been amazing. Um, I was showing my 92 year old mother my, uh, I took some pictures of the kids uh, from the back so they can't see them, but um, of what they're doing. And my mother's like, they're all in these, they're all on their computers. Aren't you going to become obsolete? <laughs> and I said to her, no, I still have to teach it. I still have to provide the curriculum. But they're, they're loving it. They're, the kids are engaged. It's the constant feedback back and forth. I'm on, I'm on the computer in front of the class, instantly teaching them um, what they need to know, changing things around, highlighting things, and they're with me. And it's, it's been absolutely incredible. So, this little dog has learned a few new tricks, and uh, I'm very happy about that. So, uh, uh, so, Carmen's a really interesting one, and uh, I really like your point there at the end. The idea, like, I mean, I, this is going to be preaching the word because you're all here, but there are a number of staff that you run into who are kind of concerned about technology, but the idea of fear, like, am I going to be replaced? Am I, am I leading to my the end of my own career? And Again, I, I guess I understand to an extent, but I, I think it's crazy. Like in a lot of ways, I think it's going to completely change what we're doing. We're kind of on this really interesting arc where teaching practice is going to change dramatically over the next five or six years, but in a really, really positive way. And I think again that people talk about the idea you're shifting more into a coach or facilitator, and that's what I really see myself. And I think that's, I'm excited for it. I'm really that's kind of where I've been the past couple of years, and that's where my shift in practice. And I think we're going to see a really large uptake in student learning. A lot of people. Is there a lot of money spent on the teacher training? Um, so that's a good question. We definitely have access to it. And if one thing I can take away, um, I was sitting down <coughs> from some people on our board who run PD, and I said, like, and this is, I, I mean, this in all due deference, I really, I've learned a lot from them. But I kind of said, honestly, the best teacher training I've seen is just giving the kids the Chromebooks. Um, we're in that day and age where it's very easy to learn something on your own. This is something I focus on my students a lot. Like you don't need me to be the founder of knowledge. Well, there's this thing called Google where you just type in your question and then there's uh, like thousands of web pages showing you how to do it. Or you go to YouTube and put something in and there's a video of like, like 100 different people telling you how to do this. Uh, I've had friends install and like, finish their basements who have no construction experience whatsoever by watching YouTube videos. Uh, they have no plumbing experience. They're, I would not do this myself, but they were putting bathrooms themselves in their homes. And that's the world our kids live in now. They can go and find the information on their own. I think that's really important as a teacher too, is not to replace anyone at a, like a board level who works in that space, but it's very easy to go learn things on your own. That's where I've learned most of my stuff, is just Googling and figuring out there's people who love to share. Um, I'm just gonna jump to one more quick video. I wanna be conscious of time to get you guys out of here. 
Um, and just talking about kind of the difference between teacher and student voice here. If you want to go, please feel free to leave. We will not take so it personally. So, I'm Alice Hawkins, and I teach grade one English at Huron Heights. And I'm just going to say a little bit about um, how the Chromebooks have changed. Uh, something that we did all the time in our class, um, and this is within the first few weeks of, the, of using the Chromebooks. So, um, in our program, in grade nine, we read Q for Treason, which is a very old book. And <laughs> the kids laugh because uh, the copies that we give the kids have uh, duct tape holding them together, and uh, sometimes they explode and they have things like that. And uh, we, we found that we could get a copy of it in a PDF form online. So we have the kids, they have a hard copy of the book, but they also can access it through their Chromebook. And one day in class, this is Kayla. I'm <laughs> sorry, I should introduce her. And Kayla um, was listening and had her Chromebook. So she had an earphone in and listening. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm listening to Q for Treason. And so I was stop everything. How are you doing this? So tell me what you did to uh, so get to it. What I did is I took the PDF online and I copied and pasted it onto a Google Docs account. And then there's like a read really and write thing on it. And it was kind of like press play and then it like kind of spread it. Mm -hmm. So I was so we sort of stopped the class and I said, how many people know about this? And they, a lot of the kids had already figured it out and I didn't even know about reading right at all. So it was, uh, oh, this is exciting. So we, we got it and I, I hooked my Chromebook up to the speakers in the, in the class and we, we found out that you can have different accents on read and write. So then I said, well, this is, a, this is supposed to be a British kid. So we, we put the British accent on it and then we played it and the kids Saying, oh yeah, I do that, and then, then we had this whole discussion about listening to Cute for Treason. And what can you tell them about what you said about listening and reading? Um, it actually helped me like understand the book a lot more because, like, especially since the book's like really old and it's kind of confusing and a little boring, so things that made us a lot easier to like actually like put it in my mind and make it easier to remember. Right. So I said, isn't that great? Because now we're you're reading, but you're listening as well, so you know, we're hitting at all these different ways of taking in information. So then I started thinking, well, that's sort of that idea of using it as a tool and making your job easier. So my next step, and Kayla doesn't know this yet, um, is we're going to use it for student writing. So they're about to start writing a formal paragraph, and because it works through Google, I'm going to have the students listen, they're going to write their paragraph, and then they're going to listen to their paragraphs before they submit it, because we find that I've always said to kids, you should read your writing out loud. Um, and this way, the computer or the, the Chromebook's going to do it for them. And they can listen. And especially if kids are having problems with doing punctuation, it reads to the punctuation, it reads to the periods. So they'll be able to hear, did that sentence make sense? And so before I ever get to evaluating it or giving feedback, it's another step that they have to utilize the Chromebook to, you know, to, to check their work, essentially. And then, of course, during writing conferences, we can listen to it. So just this last week, and it wasn't Kayla, but one of my other students came for some help, and I said, let's listen to your first paragraph, to your paragraph, and he had not punctuated. And I said, do you see how this is a problem when you haven't punctuated? And he's like, oh yeah, now it makes sense. So I think this is, we're just, we're just at the start of discovering what this is gonna do for us with writing. So I really like this video for a few reasons. Um, talk about the ceremony and see like the evolution of how things are happening and just using the technology to okay like instead of reading this myself I can have the computer do it for me okay that's cool and then talking about like different voices and the punctuation and the pronunciation of words uh, and then the evolution to she's flipping hey this is a great tool I can flip this into how to improve student writing have them listen to their own writings again we have a lot of experience we tell our kids to read out loud to themselves or have some read to you but it often doesn't happen be able to kind of click a button on the Chromebook and have it read back to them, they're hearing where things are wrong. They may not intuitively know what's wrong, but by hearing it, they can go and find it. And the other interesting thing is we're talking about, again, this PD or how do we get things out there. We've had, like there's been our schools, like the emails come out, you want to go to the board and learn about read and write, that's great. Um, but again, teachers are very busy people. They're going through their 20 emails and been posting staff conference in the past hour and that was probably just skipped over. 
but students are naturally spotting these things. And the word spreads very quickly. A teacher didn't know about it, sees a student doing it, and that has evolved her practice right there. And students share amongst themselves. Um, again, we had no service teachers but the students to use this, but one figures it out and it kind of evolves and moves through school just by having the devices there for them. Yeah. I think one of the keys is that your instructor is so enthusiastic about the whole development. And for sure. And being able to think on the fly, which that's where the adult part comes in. That's where the teaching part comes yeah. in. Where she's able to say, okay, well, if I can do this, this, and this, she puts it into play, and she can do it on the fly. Absolutely. And it's all good. Yeah. And I think, again, just kind of, I really like love your piece. The one thing I've seen more and more of this is just the things happening on the fly now. It's not the, let's bring everyone out and you need release time to do this. It's just things happening organically within the school. And I said, like, out of everything I could say with the one to one, it's been phenomenal on the student level. And I didn't think this would happen. No, I wasn't thinking about it from a teacher practice standpoint, because it was like, let's get the kids' devices. It's going to be so transformative for our kids, and it has been. But without any really formal movement at the board level, at the school level, I've seen the dramatic change in teacher practice. Like, law, there's tons of stories like this where school yeah. things happen. Yeah, the other part is, is she's demonstrating the team is learning, right? Absolutely. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. 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 Um, it's the end of the day, so I'm just going to jump through here. Uh, again, kind of just kind of on that, like you know, this is the, kind of one of the kind of last lessons I kind of took away from this. We really often have this view of PD. A lot of teachers have this view of PD. Um, but again, it doesn't necessarily need to be formed. Those very informal sessions in the immersed school, like we've had days where we've pulled staff out to come together and share ideas. It has not been a top-down approach. Let's just talk. What's working? What's going well? What's not going well? Who's got a solution to this? And things just conversations pop up organically. Small groups form, and feedback at the end of those days from our staff has been fantastic. This was really useful <coughs> for me. This met my personal needs today. I learned a great deal. And again, if I can say one thing, take away from this from a staff standpoint is. That is a really, really effective way to change teacher practice. Um, thank you for joining us right today. We're happy to stick around for any questions. If you want to just get going, it's been a long day, I'm sure. We can just pull up your resource yeah. slide. On the slides here. So okay. just uh, uh, by way of awareness, um, we will um, put the video uh, online. Um, I've got a couple links here to uh, different resources around Futures Forum. Uh, but the first part here, if you capture my blog address, today's blog post is about this session and uh, the slide deck's there, and uh, we'll add the video resources there. And, uh, our contact information is in the slide deck, so uh, certainly get in touch if you want. I don't know if you have any questions, further comments, or do you have a report from the one? Like, you guys can just like compile that. Happy to talk to you about it. It's probably, arguably, not as well documented. I'll say on paper as it, as it should be. But this was a project that evolved through our technology steering committee, uh, IT, and, and our learning services department working together to again focus on innovation and change of practice. This was another one of our things based on principal feedback, and I will be putting uh, more of those videos online. Uh, it's been overwhelmingly, let's go. Let's can we go faster? So one of the things we need to talk about is how much more can we do next year? Yeah. So, our so email <laughs> we may compile a bunch of blog posts from the three schools, from teachers, administrators, students, and we'll kind of compile that together in one spot to kind of document the process. Again, maybe not a formal research paper that you're looking for, but uh, a lot of on the ground experience. And now it's fine. And now it's fine. Lovely. Well, thanks for choosing our session today. I hope you uh, enjoyed the, uh, the virtual field trip.